All right, so now we go from convolution to deconvolution with the first method uh, in this course. So let me actually just copy and paste and rename. So this would be simple deconvolution. Uh, maybe let's name it even TSVD, so it's truncated SVD. Huh. All right. Illustration deconvolution in 1D, uh, the method, method, method uh, we use is uh, truncated singular value decomposition. All right, so let's remember what was going on in our test. Let's just run this and see what happens. Um, Okay, we are still using these. Let's let's return back to normalizing the PSF and see what did we have. So we have uh, the black line is original signal, the red line uh, is our measurement. It's the convolution plus some little noise, and then uh, this is. Uh, the naive inversion, including the so-called inverse crime. The inverse crime uh, is, is an important concept when, when simulating inverse problems with a computer. Namely, we generated our data with the very same model we used for the inversion. So then we can actually get uh, deceivingly good uh, results. Although we can see this, these weird wiggles here, it's still kind of unrealistically good, this result. This is more realistical thing because uh, with the very small noise we have here uh, in the measurement, we end up having a lot of noise here, which we saw it's because we have a, a small singular value in the kind of the last singular value is quite small, so one over that is big and it will multiply the noise. So now we'll try um, to do, let's keep the convolution matrices and all of that. Oh, let's let's recall also if we um, okay, I even have this. Uh, we have this pseudo inverse, which does the trick uh, of of taking care of the possible zero values in the, in the uh, single value decomposition. Actually, the pseudo inverse, what it's doing, it's pretty much go, doing the same thing that's, than truncated singular value decomposition, but going all the way uh, up to R, to the last non-zero one. So that's roughly what, what that's doing. But just using the naive inversion with the inverse, I think we we have a, we have an error message because the matrix is singular, and we had to go down with the size of our problem to something like sixty four. Uh, not even then working because yeah we have a, a longer point spread function. But I think if this is smaller, not even then. So I think if we go. No, we can't really. There is no, there is no no inverse. At least no numerically stable inverse. So that's why we had to do the pseudo inverse. But today we will do something different. So so with the pseudo inverse, it was our only way to get anything out of it. And even then, we saw the amplification of noise. So now let's correct for that. Mm, I think. Uh, uh, so this is the simulation of the measurement, and then uh, here compute uh, truncated SVD solution. Okay, so now instead of these inv and pin businesses, we 
we need to compute the SVD. Mm. So now let me just cheat a little bit and remember uh, the notation in MATLAB for SVD. So you see, is this is the notation, so we get this Q and V uh, for the matrix X, and then we have this one that was also written on the blackboard. So let's use this, this formula here. So actually we will not do this at all, we will do something else, but here... Uh, and let's call this D to keep with the same notation. Determine the SVD and actually let's just uh, take a look at the singular values. I'll put with the logarithmic scale. Uh, so I think uh, I think it should go like this. Let's see. Uh, and let's do them with red dots. Okay, so here we have a uh, first rather okay sized singular values and then we have one which is the size of the machine epsilon pretty much because you see there is a 10 to the minus 16 is the accuracy of computation. So it's that kind of a matrix and also like we also tried out these uh, bigger situations. For example, for this one we had 400 and actually we had uh, a wider uh, point spread function. We could also take a look at that one actually. Uh, we could have first uh, um, to see what are the non-zero values in the matrix A and then in the second plot to see the singular values. Spy uh, will show non-zero values in a matrix. Well, this is, there are now so many. Let's, let's uh, redo the smaller one so you can see what does it mean. So if, if we take here, it's 32 and here just 7. Let's go back to that one for a minute. So you see, here we see the 32 by 32 matrix and there's a dot for every non-zero matrix element. So it's, it's a way to see what kind of structure does the matrix have. So here we see the circulant uh, structure typical for convolution matrices. And, and here are the singular values. We could actually also put here uh, non-zero elements in A and And here are singular values. Log plot. Like this. And now we can go for the bigger matrix, which is more interesting. Uh, why I hope to explain later today or at latest on Friday. So first if we just make a bigger bigger matrix, here it's again with seven, uh, the length of the PSF is seven, so we see this band diagonal uh, again, but in a bigger matrix, and the singular values uh, are again kind of 
slowly dropping down and the, there are last really really small ones that are actually uh, blowing up, uh, actually preventing the numerical inversion of the matrix A, those really small ones. And I think if we make a longer, longer PSF, uh, I think the singular values are going a little bit smaller, not dramatically, but, but a little bit. And, and we have some more small ones, you see there, there are a, a few more here uh, in the machine epsilon range. Is there like one of the large pieces? Sorry, can you repeat, please? Niin kuin yksi on sanotaan pidempi, niin se on se uusi toinen näiden kahden veen ja muun takia vai? Mikä on pidempi? Toi yksi punainen kahden. Täällä. En osaa sanoa, mä luulen, että se on vaan se, kun meillä on sitten pidempi tämä point spread function tässä. Se jotenkin tulee... Joo. En tiedä, tässä tapahtuu, <laughs> tapahtuu yeah, kaikenlaista yeah, yeah. analyysiä, vaikea, vaikea sanoa ehkä intuitiivisesti. So I don't really know intuitively why there are now more of those. Or my intuition says that because the point spread function is longer, uh, the, the averaging process it, it, it implements is more severe and that will, that will uh, throw away more information. But why exactly, uh, it, it's hard to say. I, I think in this kind of case it's, it, it's more the issue to... to Trust the numerics, see how it looks like, and then to see what it is. It may be difficult to really uh, analyze, analyze that. Uh, okay, and then maybe we could also... Well, let's, let's do the... Actually, let's do the... Let's do this uh, truncated SVD. Uh, maybe we can move this down a little bit and call them plots. And here, uh, compute reconstruction. So actually now, uh, we, we, have, we have V first, like we computed. Then we should have this D uh, plus Alpha, which we need to which we need to compute, and then we have here we have u transpose, and let me just let me just use the dot transpose. This is just a debugging convention of my own, uh, because only this one will uh, both transpose and complex conjugate. Now here it doesn't make any difference because our matrix is real valued. However, in such applied math projects where matrices are complex valued, uh, it's, it's a good idea to keep this just, uh, just transpose separate from transpose and complex conjugation. Because I have some, some history of difficult debugging after <laughs> mistakes coming from this, so that's why. Okay, and we should compute this um, we can even do it this in in uh, in a quite simple way. Let's put four. Let's do a for loop. Uh, one to R alpha. And for those of you who may wonder about why this stupid I I I, uh, that's because uh, in the past in MATLAB I was the imaginary unit. It may still be, but now they are recommending to use one i. But anyway, i, so this led to very difficult debugging uh, after the index, after the for loop changed the imaginary unit. So then in complex valued computations, it was kind of, uh, the results were unexpected because i wasn't anymore the imaginary unit. It was, for example, uh, 35. <laughs> so, so that's why I, I, I started using this clumsy, but, uh, uh, debug safe notation. So let's do this dp alpha. Let's initialize it as zeros uh, of size a. In this case, a is square, so that will be fine. And then we'll uh, dp alpha 
the diagonal element i i i i i i we will replace by one over singular value of the same index. So I think this should implement uh, our d plus alpha and then from the noisy data I think it's just applying the same thing to the noisy data. So let's see what happens. Mm. Okay, error, uh, yes. All right, so we have we have reconstructions, very smooth. Uh, however, now we can immediately see that if we take, uh, so this was 1% noise. We can move to 10% noise. A lot more noise, reconstructions are just the same. No visible difference in the reconstructions. We can have even more noise, we can have a 100% noise. It has no effect on the reconstructions. So, of course, these reconstructions are not very perfect. Uh, they do capture something that on the left it's kind of bigger and on the right it's kind of zero-ish. Uh, but the main thing is that it's, it's quite uh, robust to noise. We can even have much bigger noise than the signal itself. Now we start seeing a little uh, problem with the with the noisy the reconstruction of the noisy data, but still, it's still describing something real about the true thing. So this is our first robust inversion, and after the break, let's study a little bit more the role of the singular vectors and and our alpha. <laughs>